Good morning. My name is Jean Nagelkirk and I'm the Vice Provost for Health at Grand Valley State University. On behalf of our health form of Northern Michigan partners, which include Northwestern Michigan College, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan, Grand Valley, Grand Traverse Regional Community Foundation, HealthSpark, and Munson Care, welcome to our panel discussion today titled Protecting Our Mental Health. The purpose of the Health Forum series is to offer a venue for discussion on health topics pertinent to the well being of the Northern Michigan area. Through these forums, experts will share information on thorny healthcare problems facing <clears throat> our communities. Grand Valley has been part of the Northern Michigan community for over 25 years, providing educational programming and services. We appreciate our strong partnership with Northwestern Michigan College and work collaboratively to build the healthcare talent pipeline for the Northern Michigan region. As part of our commitment in preparing the future healthcare talent workforce in our state, we value the contributions we have with many of you who are our healthcare and organizational partners. Grand Valley is especially pleased to co-host the Health Forum as we offer several programs in the Traverse City Regional Center in a variety of formats so that individuals have flexibility in their schedules and are able to attend educational programming. We offer in-person, hybrid, and online course delivery. These programs include undergraduate degrees in allied health sciences, <clears throat> health information management, integrative studies, nursing and respiratory care, as well as graduate degrees in physician's assistant studies and educational leaderships at the master's and specialist levels. Today, our expert panelists will provide information on mental health. According to the Center for Disease Control, mental distress is prevalent in over 43 million American adults, and one in five of our children experience a severely debilitating mental disorder. Unfortunately, the pandemic has increased individuals' feelings of anxiety, loneliness, burnout, and isolation. Information from a US panel survey indicates that during the pandemic, 40.9% of respondents reported mental or behavioral concerns with 13.3% reporting that they increased or initiated substance use. Our panelists will address the impact of the pandemic on mental health, share details on the state's programming and services, describe the mental health resources in Northern Michigan and discuss challenges facing students in K-12. Before we begin, I'd like to thank Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Michigan for sponsoring this event and for the entire series this year in Northern Michigan. I'd like to give a special thanks to Diane Dykstra, our special events coordinator, who makes sure that each of these events go seamless. It is now my privilege to introduce a colleague, Margarita Cotto, Vice President for Lifelong and Professional Learning at Northwestern Michigan College, who will provide opening remarks. Marguerite? Thank you, Jean. Buenos dias. Good morning, everyone, and welcome. We've taken pride over the last few years of this series to welcome you in person at the Haggerty Center on the Great Lakes campus of Northwestern Michigan College in Traverse City. Clearly, we're welcoming each other differently these days, but I'd like to say a few words about the gathering, all of you who are joining us today. As each of these generations of series have moved forward, we have noticed, and it's particularly true this morning, a growing virtual community interested in these topics that we are so pleased in partnering with Grand Valley State University to be able to offer in the form of these expert forums. We're welcoming communities from the north and eastern side of the state of Michigan. We are welcoming friends and colleagues from Grand Rapids, from Allendale, and from uh, out of state, from Ohio. Welcome all. It's the community of interest, the community of professionals that we are most interested in reaching through this forum. And as all of you work and interconnect in your professional endeavors, we do see the ripple effect that we had dreamt about when we first were imagining this conference taking place. We also want to speak to the community at large that has an opportunity to join us and is looking at the 
problems, the questions, the solutions that we can enact collaboratively for the improvement of the community today. As Jean mentioned, Grand Valley State University has been a partner with us for over 25 years. They are a founding member of the University Center celebrating 25 years of commitment to educational opportunities and development opportunities for our communities. And we welcome all of you. You are the audience, the purpose of this series. And so let me return it back to Jean. Thank you and I hope you enjoy your morning. Thank you, Marguerite, I appreciate that. I am excited to share today that Grand Valley and our partners will celebrate Rural Healthcare Today with you by introducing an annual Rural Healthcare Award program to recognize the accomplishments of an outstanding organization and practitioner serving the Northern Michigan communities. The first award recognizes an outstanding community-based healthcare organization, which has made significant contributions to the health of individuals and families in rural areas and has improved access to healthcare delivery and services through their innovative approaches. This year, the Rural Health Award Committee has selected War Memorial to receive this award. The Grand Valley Physicians Assistant Program nominated War Memorial for, the, for this prestigious award for their dedication to providing comprehensive quality healthcare services to its communities and for being an exceptional educational partner. Collectively, War Memorial practitioners, administrators, and staff consistently demonstrated commitment to patient care and community service for their communities. The organization worked tirelessly with patients, their families, and loved ones to provide care plans for optimal health outcomes. Accepting the War Award for War Memorial Hospital is the hospital chief executive officer, David John. Congratulations, David, to you for your leadership and to all of the War Memorial Hospital staff. We'll hear a few words from David. Thank you, Jean. Um, I uh, am honored to accept this award on behalf of our care team here at War Memorial Hospital. It's been a challenging year uh, for us and for everybody. Um, we, uh, we were saddened when we had to shut down and, and not have the Grand Valley students here training, but uh, we quickly rebounded and uh, got them back on our campus so that they could continue their education. We've had a longstanding partnership with, with Grand Valley. In the last five years, we've had 27 Grand Valley students in a variety of areas uh, trained here at War Memorial Hospital. Um, we look at this partnership as something that's important to us uh, to provide access to care for our patients. And also it's a great uh, recruitment tool um, because, you know, Sault Ste. Marie probably isn't on every, anybody's radar as a garden spot to go and live. But when people get up here and see what we do for our community and how nice it is in Sault Ste. Marie, you know, we've been able to hire about 10 Grand Valley students in the last five years. So it, it is a great partnership. and. Uh, I really appreciate uh, what Grand Valley uh, does, does for us. And uh, we, uh, we enjoy the students, our staff uh, comment all the time, what great students they are. And uh, I, I, I really appreciate the uh, Physician Assistance Program for nominating us and uh, for Grand Valley for honoring us with this award. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. You provide such exceptional care in your community and we appreciate all the education that you do for all the students, whether it's for our programming or others. So thanks again. Our second award today is presented to an outstanding practitioner who exemplifies the qualities of an expert clinician who delivers comprehensive quality patient care, provides health promotion education and engages in active community service. This honor is awarded to Dr. Marilyn Conlon, a psychiatrist who practices at Wellspring Psychiatry in Traverse City. Marilyn was nominated by Grand Valley's Kirkhoff College of Nursing for her dedication to providing behavioral health care. Dr. Collin is an expert clinician serving as a guide and resource for many individuals. She provides individualized care to her clients, engages in community education on mental health resources and mentors health professional students in her practice. Marilyn is a dynamic individual whose experiences have spanned 20 years of work in the mental health area of geriatric psychiatry, Department of Corrections, 
youth and adolescent health, substance abuse and disorders, as well as general practice. Congratulations, Dr. Conlon. And now we'll hear a few words from Dr. Conlon. Thank you so very much for this award. Um, I am very pleased to be your uh, recipient for the Rural Health Practitioners Award of the Year. Um, there are so many other folks who are more deserving than I am. So uh, thank you very much. And thank you to the Kirkhoff School of Nursing uh, for nominating me for this, uh, this award. Um, there are uh, many folks I would uh, like to thank in my uh, 25 years of practicing in Northern Michigan, uh, but suffice it to say from addiction treatment to um, uh, chronic mental health, from patients to the students. Um, I enjoy coming to work every day and I hope to continue for quite some time to come. Uh, thank you again. Uh, very much appreciated. Uh, this will go right up on my wall. Thank you so much, Dr. Conlon, for your expert work and your help for the community. Now, I'll have the privilege of introducing our moderator, Dave Mengebeer. He is the president of Grand Traverse Community Foundation. Prior to jo joining the Community Foundation in 2018, David served for 17 years as the senior vice president of governmental regulatory and public affairs for consumer energy. He also served as the president of their foundation. Dave also serves on Northwest Michigan's Regional Economic Development Organization, Traverse Connect, and the Little Traverse Conservancy. He's a very busy man. So, Dave? Thanks, Jean, and thank you to our audience for joining us this morning. We have a terrific lineup of subject matter experts to discuss a very important issue, rural mental health a critical issue for Northern Michigan and for our state, and especially relevant and timely given the impact of the pandemic on all of our lives. Our panelists this morning include John Villacerda with the Behavioral Health and Developmental Disabilities Administration, Dr. Shoba Ryan, a nurse practitioner at Munson Health, Dr. Curtis Cummings, medical director of the Northern Lakes Community Mental Health Authority, and Dr. Nick Seglaric, superintendent, Traverse Bay Area Intermediate School District. Just a few comments about the logistics for our forum. Each of our panelists will have 10 to 12 minutes to present to us. Once the presentations are completed, we will call the speakers back to our virtual stage for a joint question and answer period. We're broadcasting through Zoom webinar this morning, and you'll find that there's a Q&A tool when you hoover your cursor at the bottom of your screen. We encourage you to go ahead and submit any questions you may have for our speakers during the presentations, so we will be ready for that portion of our event. I will try to get through as many questions as time permits. If you'd like, a specific speaker to address your question, please indicate their name and question. After the event, we will post slides for those speakers who have given us permission to do so. The website will be listed in the chat box for you. So our first presenter is John Villacerda. John is Assistant Administrator to the Deputy Director of the state's Behavioral Health and Developmental Disabilities Administration an agency within the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. His primary duties include strategic initiative development and implementation, spending planning and budget oversight, IT project strategy and policy and legislative analysis. John leads the administration's Medicaid Home Health Initiatives, Michigan Center for Medicaid and Medicare Services Certified Community Behavioral Health Clinic Demonstration and the development of the Michigan Crisis and Access Line. John also serves as project director for Michigan's Promoting the Integration of Primary and Behavioral Health Care Grant. He holds a Bachelor's of Science degree in Psychology and a Master of Public Health in Health Management and Policy from the University of Michigan. He also completed a Health Policy Fellowship in 2015 with the University of Michigan Center for Health and Research Transformation. 
John, I'll turn the podium over to you. Okay, thank you, David, I appreciate it. I am going to bring up my slides here, so just bear with me for a minute while I bring them up. Okay, can everybody see? Yes. Perfect. <laughs> All right, well, good morning. And thank you for having me. And I'm glad that I was able to, um, you know, uh, participate in um, this event today. And on behalf of my uh, supervisor and boss, um, Al Jansen, who really wishes and would uh, talked, was excited to be here, but unfortunately had a um, a, a loss or basically um, uh, in, in pending loss with uh, a, a member of his family. So um, my thoughts, you know, are definitely with him, but, um, you know, we, we've, we've talked about all the things that I'm going to talk about today. In fact, I lead a lot of them on, you know, our behalf. So i um, glad to be here in his stead. So why don't we go ahead and get started. Um, just real quick, I want to give an overview of Michigan's public behavioral health system. Some folks might be familiar with this in general, but um, we have 46 community mental health services programs that serve all of Michigan's 83 counties across the state. Um, in terms of the Medicaid services, we have 10 Medicaid prepaid inpatient health plans. And those health plans are responsible for administering the Medicaid specialty services and supports benefit for specialty behavioral health services. And that includes um, services to the uh, populations with intellectual and developmental disabilities as well. Um, our population served include those in crisis and then persons with serious mental illness, children with serious emotional disturbance, people with intellectual and developmental disabilities and persons with substance use disorders. In 2019, you can see that our um, number of persons served was over 300,000. Um, 3.2 billion of which, or 92%, was uh, for mental health, and then 8% um, or 269 million for substance use. And about 90% of our entire population um, was served via Medicaid, meaning that was their principal payer uh, for reimbursement. On the right, you can see our FY21 enacted budget, which is different than what I put under the total served here. Um, the 21 budget, we don't have the data yet for 2020 in terms of total served, but you can see the breakdown in terms of mental health versus substance use and then the Medicaid portion or federal portion is roughly the same. Well, I mean, as, as it's been, you know, said so many times and in so many ways, um, COVID-19 really has been the dominant um, healthcare item on everybody's mind with, uh, you know, rightfully so. And, you know, we've labeled this slide perseverance in a time of extraordinary need because at our level and, you know, in dealing with the crises and still implementing behavioral health services and supports really is the essential um, mission that we have. So we have to kind of, you know, work through the COVID-19 pandemic, but also find ways to persevere, to motivate and really to um, ensure that our vulnerable, our most vulnerable populations still have access to services. And you can see a smattering of different um, topics here that you know, we have been working on to ensure that that happens. Um, telehealth in particular has been absolutely huge in terms of our ability to maintain services. While we have you know, some services that have to be delivered face to face and they're really Kind of starting back in earnest now, um, particularly with regards to you know IDD and autism types of care. Um, everything else you know that can uh, or feasibly could be done via telehealth, we have been taking advantage of. Um, targeting unmet need—that's certainly a major goal of ours. We know that <clears throat> Alterum, uh, sponsored by the Michigan Health Endowment Fund. Uh, produced a study a couple of years ago that indicated that um, there are severe gaps in terms of Michigan's public behavioral health system, as well as um, with the commercial system as well. 
Um, so there's certainly things that we are doing well and um, a lot of strategies that we'll talk about, I'll talk about a little bit uh, later in the slides, but there's clearly opportunities for improvement and that's what we're focused on. Um, this is just a slide that shows the symptoms of anxiety relative to COVID-19. And you can see Michigan in particular is in that fourth quartile, meaning, um, you know, while most people um, have been hit by the pandemic and affected by the pandemic, Michiganders in particular have disproportionately been affected by the pandemic. Um, that's something to keep in mind when I talk about some of our initiatives uh, coming up. So in terms of COVID-19 and our response, there's several buckets that we pursued to essentially help um, coordinate and really kind of strengthen our response. That includes pursuit of Medicaid emergency authorities. Um, I've listed three here. Essentially, those allow us to waive certain rules and regulations uh, to deliver services on a telehealth basis, but also to pay differently for um, basically retainer payment to maintain an adequate workforce, um, as well as to allow for flexibilities necessary um, to keep people in services so that they don't drop off, for example, uh, due to not being able to get a reauthorization of a given service. Uh, very important, and they really kind of set the stage for um, the interim policies and procedures we've been able to push out. Um, in addition to the Medicaid flexibilities, we also have been awarded and implemented federal grants, namely uh, from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration within uh, the federal government. And that includes an emergency grant for SMI and SUD services in the amount of $4.8 million, which we've been working with CMHSP's Community Mental Health Service programs across the state to implement. Um, and that really has a target on persons with mental illness, um, including mild to moderate mental illness, as well as um, an allocation directed towards uh, healthcare practitioners as well. Um, then we also received a SAMHSA FEMA Crisis Counseling Program grant, which is associated with our Stay Well uh, program. And what that really is, is a dis disaster distress relief grant um, done a little bit, you know, creatively because of the pandemic and needing to have it be virtual. Uh, just a real quick, you know, historically those grants were made for natural disasters. So uh, counseling could still be done, you know, in person, but given the nature of the pandemic, we've been um, creative in, in basically making it done through call centers um, and, you know, online uh, therapists and other supports in order to um, achieve that goal. We also implemented a crisis text line, um, and all of these services uh, can be found on our Stay Well website too, which I'd be happy to share um, if folks, you know, aren't familiar with that. But crisis text line essentially allows people that, you know, are feeling anxious or depressed to text a number and um, have a confidential, you know, text chat with, um, you know, qualified person to help them, you know, through their, uh, get the support that they need through this time. Um, the peer warm line, I believe we passed, surpassed 20,000 calls since its inception in April. Um, and it really is meant to provide peer supports to persons that really want somebody to talk to about their lives that they can trust that have been in a similar situation as their own. Um, and then finally, continued state general fund uh, su support. Um, we're thankful to the legislature for um, appropriating monies to help our uh, community mental health services programs and the other providers of specialty supports and services uh, during this time. So moving on, in terms of FY21 investments, and this one is um, particular to Northern Michigan um, and rural areas too, we expanded what are what we call the Medicaid health home initiatives, both the behavioral and the opioid health homes. And some of the folks on here may have heard this, but um, the maiden voyage uh, region, if you will, really was region two, which is that northern uh, lower peninsula chunk. Um, and we implemented the opioid health home there back in 2018, but we expanded it um, in 2020. With the behavioral health home, it was only in Grand Traverse and Manistee counties, but we've since expanded it to the entire county. Really what the health homes are, are an integrated care program 
uh, whereby a multidisciplinary team of providers um, works to treat the whole person and it allows for Medicaid reimbursement in order to do that. It really is the intensive care management and care coordination service that are that often comprise the intangibles of care. So one of the um, really cool things about our initiative is that we uh, require our prepaid inpatient health plan to be the lead entity um, of our health home. And then they contract with health home partners from both the specialty behavioral health side of the equation, as well as more physical health care. So um, that means, you know, typical kind of specialty behavioral health providers like CMHSPs or specialty SUD, substance use disorder providers, and then also providers of primary care or federally qualified health centers or rural health clinics or tribal health clinics, et cetera. Um, one of those clinics that's actually one of our shining stars is Travers Health Clinic, which folks are likely familiar with. Um, and we appreciate the partnership that we have with them and um, know that their enrollment you know, has you know, increased over time and they've been able to serve more people particularly in the opioid health home, um, you know, as we've, uh, you know, kind of went on and, and evolved in our health home initiatives. These are very exciting. You can see since we went go live with the expansions, which we expanded into the Upper Peninsula and different uh, areas of um, the lower, southern part of the Lower Peninsula as well. And we're seeing a lot of increase in, um, you know, our reach here. Uh, real quick, the behavioral health home is for serious mental illness and children with a serious emotional disturbance. And then the opioid health home is, of course, for persons with opioid use disorder. Um, one of our other investments that I'll touch on briefly here is the Michigan Crisis and Access Line. Um, so this was signed into law back in January of 2020 and requires the department to stand up a centralized command center for dealing with crisis services, um, and also for attending to immediate crises and uh, helping people get the support or referral to supports that they need. So broadly, um, we are implementing a pilot that will go live in just about a month in the Upper Peninsula and Oakland County. We've been working with local stakeholders within both of those areas. And then it's our intent to roll that out to the entire state in FY22 and FY23. Really, the goal here is to create a centralized mechanism to get persons the resources they need and into the services that they need with one number and a coordination from our staffing vendor, which is Common Ground out of Oakland County, um, to work with our local providers, including CMHSPs, to dispatch mobile crisis and get people the help, help that they need as quickly as we possibly can. Um, looking forward, I'm not going to read this entire list of strategic priorities, but I am going to point out just a couple. The CCBHC or Certified Community Behavioral Health Clinic demonstration really has the opportunity to revolutionize and transform our behavioral health system, namely by providing care to anybody in need, regardless of insurance status or income. Um, and that means if you show up the at the door you know, with a mental illness or a substance use disorder, you qualify for comprehensive services as required uh, by the law that was co-sponsored by our Senator Debbie Stabenow back in 2014. And those nine core services are really comprehensive in terms of treating the whole person um, and attending to behavioral health needs. So we are working diligently with um, the sites that were part of our 2016 application to the federal government in order to stand this up by October 1 of this year. Um, so we plan on doing that and we're excited um, you know, for what that holds for the state of Michigan. Um, we're gonna further expand our Medicaid health homes and our Michigan Psychiatric Care Improvement Project, which of course is um, you know, significant in terms of persons waiting for you know, beds as well as strengthening our crisis services is a very significant um, endeavor that uh, the department, as well as many of our stakeholders, legislature included, has been um, very much, uh, um, uh, you know, working on and putting a lot of effort into. Um, I'm going to wrap it up here real quick. I wanted to say for our opioid health home, in terms of uh, region two, which is northern lower peninsula there, 
Um, we have uh, standard metrics to kind of, you know, uh, weigh ourselves and also to provide pay for performance. You can see some of those here. And um, one of the, uh, you could see kind of persons enrolled in the health home uh, from this chart for these different metrics, initiation and engagement of treatment, follow up after hospitalization and hospitalizations, um, preventable hospitalizations for SUD. The categories uh, for the, the, the lower two, the, better, the higher the number, the better. So you can see our health home enrolled population. It's kind of blowing the comparatives out of the water relative to the regional and statewide figures. And then same thing with the, with the top metric here, the lower is actually better in that in this realm. So um, a lot of good uh, measures and a lot of good outcomes, meaning for the persons that are enrolled in Northern Lower Peninsula relative to our opioid health home, which we know SUD is a severe need, particularly in that region of the state. And I will wrap it up and stop there. Thank you, John. Our next presenter is Dr. Shoba Ryan who has been a psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner since 2016 and a nurse since 2010. She joined the Munson system in 2019. In addition to seeing inpatient clients, she sees patients in an outpatient setting at both Munson Behavioral Health Services and Addiction Treatment Services. She has worked on Munson's consultation liaison service and on inpatient mental health unit as both a nurse and a provider. Shoba received her Bachelor of Nursing and her Doctorate of Nursing Practice from the University of Michigan Flint. Shoba. Hi, I'm Shoba Ryan and I am happy to be able to take this opportunity to provide you with the scope of the mental health needs and treatment um, with a focus on resilience in Northern Michigan. I'm here representing Munson Healthcare. I am stationed primarily at the Partial Hospitalization Program, which is a part of Munson Medical Center. To give you an idea of Munson's footprint on the Northern Michigan area, we serve eight regions, over 500,000 residents across nine hospitals with seven of them being fully integrated and two affiliated. Munson specifically is a tertiary care facility here in Traverse City. It's a level two trauma center. We have 442 licensed bed and are the main and is the main regional referral center. Okay, sorry. So to give you an idea of the behavioral health overview in Northern Michigan, in 2019, there was a community needs assessment completed and behavioral health access and access to treatment was across the board noted as being the number one need for every hospital in every region. Munson Healthcare has also partnered up with Pine Rest and Pine Rest is a freestanding psychiatric hospital actually based out of Grand Rapids, but they have a satellite clinic that serves, that also helps to serve the Northern Michigan area, primarily um, is one of the few resources that we have that serves uh, pediatrics and adolescents. Looking at Munson specifically, we do have a 17 bed inpatient unit. However, with COVID, um, we've had to decrease that to 16 beds just because one of the rooms is shared. You can get an idea of how the market share has increased over the last year up about 6%. Ways that we provide treatment for the community includes the partial hospitalization program. Um, we do normally have a residential substance use disorder treatment program, but that is closed due to COVID. Um, Munson Behavioral Health Services also provides medication assisted treatment for opioid use disorder. Uh, psychiatry has been a pretty big pioneer when it comes to telehealth and how it's played out in the Northern Michigan area. Um, I do get the monthly reports and we are almost consistently above 90% of our visits being held virtually. We also have a peer recovery coaching program and a crisis services team that provides 24 seven coverage. 
And this is just kind of a bigger uh, image here to give you an idea of the amount of people that we serve and the area of the region. So specifically looking at behavioral health visits that present to the emergency department. So the blue line is um, visits in the emergency department and the orange line is inpatient encounters. I will say that I, I think it's reasonable to argue that the inpatient encounters, you may not necessarily see a lot of change in that line. Um, and I think that, that part of that might be because the unit tends to, to operate at max or near capacity um, daily. All right, so looking at the same encounters, but breaking it down in age groups, as you can see, the largest population, age population that we serve is younger adults. We then have middle-aged adults and then some seniors that we also serve as well. This can give you an idea of the number of patient transfers that are behavioral health related. Um, the blue, or sorry, the yellow line is the number of total transfers. The green is external transfers, blue is internal, and then the gray is unknown. As you can see at the bottom there, there is a marker identifying March 2020 um, and kind of separating what the transfers look like pre and then after the onset of the pandemic. This is a list of the top 10 diagnoses for patients that present to the emergency department. And as you can see, major depression, anxiety, and then followed up by substance use disorder, specifically alcohol use, um, is a large percent of our population. So, because I'm a nurse and that means taking on the responsibility of providing education about disease prevention, and I'd also been asked to highlight what are some ways to keep people out of our emergency department, and that includes being resilient. Resilience teaches us to adapt, overcome, and grow from experiences such as trauma, everyday life situations, and with events such as this pandemic, which seems to be leaving a permanent and long-lasting impact affecting all facets of life. Resilience helps you handle stress more positively. Building resilience is an ongoing process requiring lifelong maintenance and work, um, but it also requires patience as it does take time. Some people do seem to just naturally be resilient, but none of us are born resilient. It's something that we have learned in life and early on in life and have cultivated as we, as we age. Oh, sorry, I'm gonna go back. Um, one thing um, resilience requires is knowing that you are worth taking time for yourself. And then why is self-worth so important? And that's because you can't pour from an empty cup. It's imperative that you take care of yourself first. This is probably one of the biggest um, issues that I see in the patients that I serve at the partial hospitalization program. Um, which is kind of also followed up by the isolation that's come from the pandemic. Resilience can come from looking for the positives during difficult times or events. Sorry. Um, resilience um, means having close relationships with family and friends, being able to let others help you and being able to help others as well. And also being able to look for and use resources. And Munson has, they posted up in March or earlier this month, a website that discusses a lot of what I've mentioned here about resilience and ways to manage stress. And I will show that at the end. Resilience also means feeling like you are in control of a situation, having confidence in yourself, knowing your strengths and not seeing yourself as a victim. Resilience also means being able to manage strong feelings and impulses. With the pandemic, there has been an increase in opioid-related uh, overdoses. 
and the American Medical Society put out an issue brief earlier this month. And what they also included was that more than 40 states have reported increases in opioid related mortality. It also underscored the need to remove barriers to evidence-based treatment and harm reduction services, which includes sterile needle and syringe services, as well as naloxone. So again, it's essential to master ways to cope um, with stress in healthy ways and avoiding some of these more harmful coping strategies. One of the main reasons why this pandemic has been so tough on us, as I said earlier, was um, is about isolation and the fact that we've been isolated from family and from friends during the lockdown regulations. But I think it's also important for us to know that mental health struggles are a part of being human. It's a sign of strength. It's so important to remember that you are not the only one. Getting help also is not limited to just talk therapy and medications. Um, for example, yoga is my therapy. I'm up at around five at least every morning to get my daily practice in. It's something that I encourage almost all of my patients. And it doesn't even necessarily have to be yoga therapy or I mean, there's all kinds of ways that you can provide self-care. For some people it's running, other people it's music. So it's important to really find what works for you and know that therapy is not limited to chit chat with the therapist. It's important to remember um, in conclusion that everything in life is about balance because without darkness, you wouldn't appreciate the light and without sadness, you would not appreciate joy. And I wanted to show you guys briefly the website that Munson has put up and this reviews managing stress through resilience. So it discusses a lot about what I, and highlights more about what I've already discussed in so far today. Talks about ways to build your inner strength and these are all links to provide more information. And then one of the other things I wanted to make sure that people were aware of is that down here at the end, they have additional resources that can help mostly with your kids, but then also other resources that can help with food bills and other basic needs. So it's a really good resource and I would encourage people to really kind of get the, um, the word out that they, this information is accessible online. Um, thank you for allowing me this opportunity, and I will hand it back over to our moderator. Thanks, Shoba. Our next presenter is Dr. Curtis Cummins, who currently serves as the Medical Director of Northern Lakes Community Mental Health Authority. Dr. Cummins also is an active staff physician with Munson Healthcare in Trevor City. He is board certified in psychiatry and addiction medicine. Dr. Cummins completed his medical education at the University of Michigan Medical School and postgraduate work at the University of Wisconsin. His interests include integrated healthcare, addiction medicine, treatment of those with schizophrenia, and lastly, crisis services. He lives in Traverse City with his spouse, Dr. Paula Colombo, who also specializes in psychiatry at Munson and their two high school age sons. Dr. Cummins. Thank you. Um, there's gonna be some overlap with uh, the MDHHS lecture that uh, John shared. So, uh, but it's good, it's, it's a good parallel discussion. Uh, so I hope to give just a general overview of Northern Lakes CMH's uh, services to the community, recognizing that we're just six counties, but still just to, for just general awareness. So to start, uh, Northern Lakes CMH is a provider of public behavioral health services and support. Next slide, please. And then as John mentioned earlier, you know, the CMHSP uh, entities across the state are charged with the care of specific populations that he listed out. And I'll repeat those here. Uh, adults with serious mental illness, persons with intellectual and developmental disabilities, children with serious emotional disturbance and persons with substance use disorders. Next slide, please. 
And Northern Lakes' mission is to improve the overall health and wellness and quality of life of the individuals and families and communities that we serve. And if we could go to the next slide. And this is, this is a slide just demonstrating our catchment area. We cover six counties in Northern Michigan, specifically the counties of Leonong, Grand Traverse, Wexford, Masaki, Roscommon, and Crawford counties. And we have offices in Traverse City, Cadillac, Houghton Lake and Grayling. Northern Lakes also owns and operates six adult foster care homes and has a singular apartment building for those with disabilities. Next slide, please. Uh, and also Northern Lakes is also part of a broader group of five CMHSPs uh, in the Northern third of Lower Michigan uh, that are part of a prepaid inpatient health plan called the Northern Michigan Regional Entity. And uh, five CMHs that covers 21 counties, region two as it's termed, and as John mentioned earlier, there are 10 PIHPs in the state of Michigan and 46 singular CMHSPs. Next slide. Northern Lakes also offers, offers services to the general public. We are mandated uh, by the state to offer crisis services 24 seven. And we also provide uh, service eligibility determination through our access department. We also pro provide information and referral to community resources also offer trainings and programming and education. Examples of such trainings would be a crisis intervention training that we provide to local law enforcement agencies. And we also uh, offer trainings on mental health first aid. I'll talk later about My Strength, which is a, uh, an application for health and wellness. And we also have two drop-in centers, one specifically in Traverse City, and then we have another one in Houghton Lake. Next slide. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, crisis services has been a very important part of what we do. Uh, one part of uh, what we have, and it complements the, the state's efforts, is a you know 24-7 uh, phone number for people to call us in crisis, families in crisis, someone's in crisis, that's defined by the person, of course, and you're able to speak with a mental health professional. And that's the number there. Uh, next slide. Part of our crisis services is FAST, and FAST stands for Family Assessment and Safety Team. It was developed in partnership with multiple community partners, including Munson Healthcare in the state of Michigan. It is comprised of three mobile crisis units that are staffed by mental health professionals on call 24 seven. They can pro provide outreach to uh, children and families uh, with the target population up to age 20. Anybody can get care through the FAST team for up to 90 days following uh, uh, an episode. Uh, next slide, please. We also have a warm helpline uh, to people in the community that anybody can call during office hours. One doesn't have to be in crisis, but you know, struggling with anything, uh, whether it be COVID related or non-COVID related. So this is another effort that we have that also parallels the state's efforts. Um, next slide, please. So Northern Lakes also provides free access to an evidence-based tool called MyStrength, which is uh, have been shown to be effective with health and wellness and providing people with resiliency tools. It's uh, being also promoted by Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Michigan for their membership. It's something that can be downloaded to a smartphone or it can be accessed through a computer. And it's free to anybody in the community. And the way to access it specifically is through the code here, NLCMH community. Next slide, please. In terms of direct care services, I wanted to highlight some of those as well. Uh, so for, and this is for all populations, children, families, adults. As I mentioned earlier, we have crisis services, which takes multiple forms. We provide uh, eligibility determinations through our access department. And beginning with the children in our communities, we have an infant mental health program that we have. We have home-based services for youth. I'll talk later about the University of Michigan MC3 program. We also offer outpatient therapy and case management services for adults and children. And we also have peer support services and psychiatric services for uh, adults and children as well. We offer supported employments and have two clubhouses, specifically one clubhouse in Traverse City and another one in Cadillac. We have jail diversion programming uh, for to our local county jails. And we specifically have two services geared towards our older adults. Uh, the OPRA program is uh, delivering services to skilled nursing facilities 
and we have a My Choice waiver program geared towards older adults living in their home. Next slide, please. I'm bringing this slide here just to kind of highlight our use of telemedicine during COVID. As a bit of background, Northern Lakes has been utilizing telemedicine and psychiatric services for over 10 years, something we've been doing a while, but definitely this past year, we're doing it differently. Uh, and what's become apparent to us uh, it, during this past year with COVID is, you know, the obvious digital divide that we that, that's throughout a rural community. People simply not having access to the internet or not having access to a smartphone or a cell phone, not having access to a computer, uh, not having an email account or knowing how to access their email, or even having poor connectivity. Uh, despite those challenges, uh, we're providing about presently about 40% of our services by video. Most of our care within psychiatric services is being done telephonically at present. And as an aside, we, we've uh, I've discovered that we're providing actually more care over this past year during COVID. And the slide here is a calendar year 2020, where the uh, the, the leftmost bar is uh, January 2020, and the rightmost bar is uh, December 2020. And the yellow represents in-person care, and the teal color is telephonic-based care. And the red was a uh, red is a uh, video-based care with people in the office, and the darker green is video-based care with somebody in their home. So we're having a video call where I might be at my house and doing a video call to somebody's home. So as you can see, we were face to face in the early part of 2020, then COVID hit. We did a lot of tele telephone based care. And as you can see, we're trying to you know, deliver as much video based care as we can, despite the challenges that we have, whereby we're you know, providing majority of our care telephonically with some with 40% you know, being video with face to face care happening you know, when clinically indicated. Uh, next slide, please. And then um, finally, in partnership, our partnership with the University of Michigan has allowed us to bring Michigan Medicine, the Child Care Collaborative or MC3 project to our community. Uh, the MC3 uh, project offers psychiatric support to primary care providers in Michigan who are managing behavioral health uh, concerns. The target population for the MC3 project are young adults up to age 26 or women who are contemplating pregnancy, pregnant and postpartum uh, women, and the MC3 program offers same day a telephonic consultation with psychiatrists at the University of Michigan. And Northern Lakes has local staff that help provide linkage and recommendations to local resources. And I wanted to show a video here next, uh, narrated by Dr. Sheila Marcus, who is the MC3 lead at the University of Michigan. There's a mental health crisis in the state of Michigan. There simply are not enough psychiatrists to go around. Providers who treat children are driven to make a difference in those children's lives. Small interventions can fundamentally change a child's developmental trajectory. Working through primary care providers is a great way to do this. They can spot which kids are headed for trouble or have risk factors so they can intervene with the family to address them. MC3 is a program that brings psychiatric consultations to primary care clinicians throughout the state. It is of no cost to either the providers or to the patients. For my patients, finding a psychiatrist was becoming increasingly more difficult. The wait times were not appropriate for help that they needed right then and there. MC3 has made it so that in real time, my patients are getting real help at a level of care that would be very similar to if they were with a pediatric psychiatrist and a care plan that would be very similar. MC3 provides same-day consultations to primary care clinicians. We help develop differential diagnoses for very complicated patients. We help provide evidence-based medication treatment recommendations. And we also support primary care clinicians in identifying appropriate therapies throughout the state of Michigan. So tomorrow, if I have a patient that I felt like I needed an MC3 consult, I would pick up the phone, call the number, give a history, get a response that day typically from a psychiatrist who will help me with a care plan, uh, give me specifics too, that helps in real time. It has almost come to the point where MC3 is, is like a colleague. It's like another person uh, down the hall that you can 
uh, tap into their knowledge, their expertise, and in the end, we have a patient that has gotten better treatment and is going to have a better outcome. And then my final slide is just saying thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you, Dr. Cummins. Our final presenter is Dr. Nick Seclerik, who has served as superintendent for the Traverse Bay Area Intermediate School District since 2018. Dr. Seclerik studied math, statistics, and psychology at Grand Valley State University earning his bachelor of degree in science and secondary education and a master's degree in educational leadership. He received his doctorate in education from Eastern Michigan University. Dr. Seclerik began his career as a teacher at Rockford Public Schools and later served as an assistant principal and director of district assessment and student testing. He also served as superintendent of Baldwin Community Schools Free Fruitport Community Schools and Hudsonville Public Schools. During that time, Dr. Sclerick was presented with the Grand Valley State University College of Arts and Science Distinguished Alumni Award and West Michigan Public Relations Society of America 2015 Communicator of the Year. He resides in Traverse City with his wife, Darcy, and two sons, Colson and Zane. Dr. Sclerick. Thank you, Dave. Uh, appreciate that introduction and really uh, appreciate the opportunity to, to discuss a, a very important topic uh, in, in education today, and that's protecting our, our students' mental health. Um, I really appreciated my uh, colleagues' conversations and presentations, uh, uh, particularly Dr. Ryan talking about resiliency, because I think that's so critically important as we talk about uh, how do we support our youth during this very challenging time. To set the context, uh, Traverse Bay Area Intermediate School District is actually going through uh, a rebranding. So you're gonna see at the bottom of the screen, Northwest Education Services. Um, and so uh, we'll be uh, going by either uh, for the next six months as we make this transition, but just a little context, we represent and support provide supports to uh, five different counties and 16 local traditional schools up in Northwest uh, Michigan. Uh, we also have, uh, uh, we also serve 18 public school academies and private schools. So in total, uh, about 22,000 students uh, that we support within the five county region. In education, we have a tendency to speak um, with uh, letters instead of words. So I'm gonna try not to do that today. Uh, when, when we're talking uh, around SEL, uh, it really is, is talking about social emotional learning. And that's been a clear focus uh, within our schools and within our region. Um, social emotional learning is defined as the process of acquiring skills, knowledge and attitudes and beliefs to identify and manage emotion. Um, it is different than uh, the definition of mental health. Uh, it's something that we want to be very mindful of, but we want to make sure that we're uh, building the skill set of our students that we serve so that they can be uh, healthy emotionally. Uh, and we want to be attuned to mental health. Uh, clearly, that affects how we feel, think, and act. This has been a, a really a national effort even prior to the pandemic. Um, ASCD, which is our one of our uh, curriculum associations as well as the Center for Disease Control, um, they, they have a joint and since 2014 have come together with a joint statement. Uh, and, it, and in sum it says, if American schools do not coordinate, modernize, their school health programs as such a critical part of educational reform, our children will continue to benefit at the margins. And so uh, I'm very proud of some of the efforts that we've made here regionally that I will get into uh, around uh, mental health and uh, social emotional learning. Um, but this is clearly an effort, not just at the national level, but at the state level as well. Uh, the Michigan Department of Education um, lists competencies and indicators back in 2017. 
And uh, they've clearly made um, a statement that it isn't enough that we try to address our social emotional learning in our schools, but that it requires uh, a community approach. And that's where you see the whole school, whole community, whole child, the WISC model that we've incorporated. But it, more importantly, it requires sound assessment so that we can really gauge where our students are at and how we might be able to support them. Just like we do with mathematics, just like we do with language arts, we really want to be intentional about assessing where our students are from a social emotional learning perspective and then provide concrete resources for them to improve their social emotional health. I wanna give a shout out to my um, colleague and friend, Dave Mingenbeer. He has been uh, a leader in our region to get um, thought partners and community leaders around the table. We're, I'm proud to sit on the Community Development for Northwest Michigan uh, Task Force. And we have identified um, uh, very specific goals as a region around the uh, economic societal and environmental environmental uh, impacts and specifically around societal you'll see that that second goal in talks about improving mental health within our youth and and we really want to target this and be intentional because we recognize in order for our students to be successful in order for our community to be successful that we have to be uh, strategic on how we're going to address mental health within our youth this may look uh, familiar to some. Uh, this is um, a comprehensive uh, model that really dates back to 1943 and 1950. Maslow developed a hierarchy of need and essentially what it, what it, what it indicates is that if our, our students' basic needs are not met and our students don't feel safe and have a, a solid sense of well-being, they simply will not be ready to learn. And so what we want to do within the schools is be intentional about building our students' capacity um, to feel to have those basic needs met, to feel safe and have a good sense of well-being, uh, to be loved and be and have belonging. And so we want to make sure we're scaffolding that for our students um, as we move forward. So a little bit about what we're doing regionally. We've actually adopted um, a, a program called SEL Web and uh, Social Emotional Learning Web is a web-based system that is designed to access key social emotional skills that are associated with success in school and life. And they target evidence-based social emotional learning programs. And what, what we actually, what you're seeing on the screen right here is actually an assessment of over 3,500 uh, pre-K through six students uh, on, uh, on a very specific assessment and task-based uh, model. And as you can see, uh, the two areas that we are gonna be focusing on to build the skill sets of our students are social awareness and self-management. These scores were derived from our, our students actually doing a task-based assessment. Um, and just for a little bit clarity and definition, self-awareness is children and students demonstrate an awareness of their own emotions. Social awareness is children and students demonstrate an awareness of other people's emotions and perspectives. So you might be thinking, okay, how do we, as a, a kindergartner or first grader, how do we assess social awareness or um, uh, self-awareness. So I give, I'm gonna give you an example here. Uh, and it seems elementary as it probably should, because uh, we're dealing with, uh, with little ones in this particular case. Um, but we're having our students um, uh, do perform this task. So you see a picture um, in early elementary and, and, and what does that picture represent? Uh, another uh, a situation around emotional recognition is describing a situation, this is later elementary, describing a situation and having the students uh, do some reflection on what this actually means. Uh, again, another couple examples of a direct assessment which allows students to demonstrate how they would apply their skills. And once, um, 
once we have uh, the skills identified or the areas, for example, social emotional uh, awareness, we then use a, a, a very targeted curriculum to build the student's skill set in that particular area. This has been a focus in our region actually prior to the pandemic, and it's been made even uh, more aware and, and been more intentional in our staff after, uh, during and after the pandemic. And I think this gives me an opportunity to then just give a shout out and, and celebrate our teachers. We've been very fortunate that the majority of our schools within our region have been face-to-face -face, um, delivering instruction, but our teachers are heroes. <laughs> they are uh, connecting with students in ways, especially during this pandemic, um, uh, to, to reiterate what Dr. Ryan said, trying to build resilience within our students. And I'm confident that our students are are more and more resilient every day. Uh, this just gives the why. Um, why would we be focusing on this instead of um, uh, really putting pouring all of our attention into um, a math or language arts and trying to bridge that gap? And, and there's actually some significant studies. This one was done in 2010 that followed a cohort of 1,000 children from birth to age 32. And it showed that self-control predict physical health, substance dependence, personal finance, and criminal offending outcomes. Um, we know that this is going to be important for our students, not just now, but into their future. And then I, I, I want to leave maybe with a little hope for all of us out there that are parents, uh, grandparents, or have loved ones that are growing uh, through the school system. We can all support our youth uh, with respect to social emotional learning and mental health. Uh, a recent article that was published in Young Success, and again, a shout out to Young Success, they have some great articles uh, around how we support our youth. And a psychotherapist says there are uh, seven things that we can do as parents and as grandparents to build mentally strong students. We can empower, uh, they um, mentally strong students empower themselves. Um, it's okay for them to say to themselves that um, I, I can't do it. Uh, they adapt to change and our students going through this pandemic are, are resilient and are adapting to change every day. They know when to say no. They own their mistakes. And this is something that uh, is hard for even adults. Uh, I will attest to that and something that we're trying to build within our students, um, celebrate their su others' successes. Uh, again, trying to get out of our own world and our students trying to recognize others. They fail and try again and they persist. And if there's one thing that we have witnessed through this pandemic within our region schools is our students are, pers uh, are persisting as well as our staff. So uh, I, again, want to thank you for allowing us to share and look forward to answering some of the uh, questions that you may have. Thanks, Nick. So at this stage, um, I'd like to invite our panelists to turn their cameras on and return to our virtual stage for the Q&A portion of our program. Uh, so I will uh, read some of the questions that we have I think this first one um, is uh, really interesting um, and gives kind of a new wrinkle on face-to-face uh, -face, uh, or, or, or educational learning versus virtual. So uh, let me read this question. Does anyone know the percentage of people who have found this new way of life, working and schooling from home, a pleasure and not a curse? And for those who have created a more mentally healthy routine for themselves, discovering and implementing the developing uh, long distance work strategies and technologies, what will mental health professionals be able to offer those individuals who have adapted well to this new way of functioning, but must inevitably return to the old face-to-face -face ways, especially the stress of possible new COVID variant exposure that we may face by going back to our old societal ways. People loving their COVID mandated spaces in the minority without much support from what I have gathered so far. So maybe I will invite 
um, Dr. Cummins and Dr. Ryan to respond to that one first. Yeah, so yeah, interesting. I think it's, uh, personally, I mean, I'm calling from my home. I've been working remotely from since mid-March. I've been in the office maybe, I don't know, 15 times. Um, I'm not sure how many hours, but not that many. It's a challenge. Uh, I would imagine as, as we all are recognizing going forward, uh, you know, the workplace is going to be different. Um, and how, how services are delivered, whether it be in, in the behavioral health world or medicine or just businesses in general. I know that Entities like Google and Facebook, they're moving their workforce out of Silicon Valley and making some of their workforce permanently remote. So I don't know, a lot, a lot's going to be written about this, I would imagine. I would just like to add that um, as far as like giving some tips to our mental health patients, I always um, stress the importance of gratitude and how that can really feed happiness and being able to find gratitude in the changes that we've had. And I think some of the ways that we can see that is a lot of our patients do like doing the virtual visits. And there are some, of course, that like the face-to-face. -face. So I think moving forward from here and being able to provide both options is gonna be something that we can be grateful for. Um, and just personally, just one way that I, I was able to find gratitude, I initially felt pretty, um, a little a little guilty, but you know, when you do yoga with a group, everyone tends to be pretty packed into a room, but now with social distancing, I've really, really appreciated the extra space. So and not everything is, not everything is bad. There's a silver lining to everything. So this is a question also for uh, you, Chauvin, for uh, Curtis. How are your relationships with local law enforcement? Do you offer educational training related to mental health for them? In terms of the workforce within the, the county jails, I can't speak to that specific answer. As I mentioned, we do provide crisis intervention training, you know, in terms of how law enforcement can respond to those persons, you know, in the community that, that may be having a, a mental health crisis and trying to figure out what's the best way to approach that in terms of jail diversion or you know incarceration programming within the jails. Um, so I can't speak specifically to our efforts in terms of the wellness of the uh, law enforcement entities myself. I can add that with respect to the relationships with law, um, law enforcement that um, happen within months and within the different domains that patients with mental health issues um, come across, whether it's consultation, inpatient, partial, um, or the emergency department, really the relationship seems to be the strongest between the emergency department and local law enforcement. So unfortunately, it's not something that I can really speak to, but I can say that when I was a nurse working in the emergency department, um, we were really receptive to law enforcement coming in and helping us, particularly when we felt unsafe or just needed some extra support. Thanks. I'm going to um, ask a question to you, John, um, and invite the other panelists to make a comment about this. What are the unique challenges uh, providing behavioral health services uh, in rural areas for practitioners like yourselves? I would say number one in rural areas from what we see is workforce recruitment and retention. Um, the ability to attract people to rural areas is not exclusive to Michigan. Um, there are programs that uh, the state and federal governments as well as private industry have um, developed that I think are definitely, you know, making a, a positive um, improvement, whether that be something like the um, National Health Service Corps or the state loan repayment program um, or graduate medical education incentives, um, et cetera. Uh, but there's clearly, you know, a lot of work to do, particularly in the behavioral health realm, as we know that psychiatrists in general um, are kind of a more aged you know, cohort of our behavioral health workforce, as well as um, out of all healthcare professionals. Um, and uh, there aren't, as we see it, you know, more um, uh, of them coming down the pike to kind of 
you know, make whole what the need when, when they ultimately do, you know, retire. Um, so that, you know, kind of, I think, puts um, an emphasis on the state as well as, you know, kind of our, our other stakeholders to think about um, other creative ways potentially to um, improve workforce recruitment and retention or scope of practice, um, which has always been, you know, a debate, I think, that we've been having for, you know, lo long before I've been in this administration and long before I, you know, entered into my professional career, but it seems like it could be, you know, the time to really kind of, you know, start honing in on some of those uh, potential alternative solutions. As, 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 Curtis or uh, Shelby, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, I'll speak to what yeah, John echoed in terms of, you know, in terms of recruiting workforce, whether it be, you know, staffing, uh, you know, let's say resident care aides and uh, ASC homes, you know, that's a significant challenge. Um, or just, you know, direct care workers providing behavioral health care. So yeah, it's, the, the challenge is not unique to Northern Michigan, it's a, it's a national issue. Uh, I mean, I can commend the state for obviously offering a, uh, a pay increase to direct care workforce more recently. That was a big part of retaining our, our workforce and trying to minimize turnover and addressing kind of workforce capacity, coming up with the innovative models or evidence-based models. As, as, I, as the MC3 video highlighted, you know, the, trying to deliver as much behavioral health care through primary care providers is also a very, a, a very good tool, evidence-based, and something that hopefully can get some traction. There are some efforts underway locally to, to uh, you know, provide that level of care, especially for the mild to moderate population that does not typically get served in the CMHST environment. So there are ways not to simply to address these those persons that need a high level of care, but also those people who need routine care. So looking at innovative models is an important piece. Shelby, do you want to comment on that? No, I don't really have anything to add. Sorry. Um, here's a question for uh, Dr. Sklarik. Um While you're educating students on social emotional learning, students and teachers, what ways are you reaching out to parents to engage and educate them on the importance of supporting their children's mental health? Yeah, thank you for the question. And, um, you know, doing it in isolation isn't going to, to fully support our students. Uh, so engaging in our, uh, our parents in, in partnering in, in social emotional learning and health is critically important. You know, similar, uh, again, we have districts that are, are, are kind of all over the spectrum in how in depth they're going with the social emotional learning. We have some districts that actually have 20 minute blocks where they, they similar to math and ELA, that they're spending time and being intentional. And with that are also communicating with parents on how their children are scoring and doing in these very specific areas. And when they see deficiencies, they provide uh, information home, just like we would with math and language arts on how our parents might be able to bolster and support their children uh, at home in these very specific areas. Again, it's, it's dependent on the district and, and where they're at. Uh, but I do think in order for us to truly be effective, we have to engage our parents in that. And that's kind of why I, I entered into that last slide. There's some realistic things that we can do to support our children at home. I want to direct a question to um, you, Shoba. You mentioned uh, in your presentation self-care. So what can we do as parents or as individuals uh, what steps can we take uh, to um, take care of ourselves, particularly during this difficult period? I think particularly for um, caregivers, it's most important that people take time for themselves. And self-care means doing something for you, just for you, that you enjoy, and making sure that it's a routine and something that you make a habit for yourself. That way you're able to continually replenish your cup so that you can give to all those that you care about. Um, and it's also important, I think, to set an example. I think the best way to show kids how to do self-care is to actually lead by example. 
So, and then also encouraging them when there's things that they really enjoy doing, encouraging them to also set aside time for themselves to do things like that as well. Uh, Curtis or John, do you want to make any, add anything to that? I can just share with the people that I serve, you know, I'm, I'm talking to them about the pandemic each and every, you know, each and every day at the clinic. And uh, how are they coping? You know, in addition to making sure they're being safe or you know, what are they doing to kind of cope? Because everybody's definitely under strain. When I talk about increasing our behavioral health or psychiatric services, we're just finding that we're seeing people more often presently just because they're feeling those kind of subtle signs or not so subtle signs of feeling stressed or more tense or anxious. So just supporting each other goes a long way. Yeah, and I, I would echo that, Dave, um, David, and because, you know, I, I have the opportunity to, you know, work with several colleagues here in our administration in the department, but we've been exclusively virtual for like over a year, and I oversee, you know, several staff, and I think it's just a matter of being human, checking in, talking, you know, about, um, you know, not just job-related duties, but, you know, how they're doing personally and, you know, just kind of light um, conversation as well. And I think that, I think that goes a long way because everybody is feeling, you know, strained from this. And I think there are, I think that, that comment that was made earlier is a really astute one relative to those that, you know, do or don't like, <laughs> you know, the, this new reality. So, you know, I think we need to attend to kind of both and it, checking in and, and just listening, I think is, uh, and being empathetic is a, you know, kind of the way to go for that. Thank you. Here's a question for you, Nick. Um, so first, thank you for sharing the importance of creating a spotlight for teachers to ensure social and emotional learning is being captured. Can this focus be done at the college level or the workplace? So I believe it can. I don't can't speak maybe specifically at the college level, but you know I'll I'll speak um, from a workplace environment. Uh, so our intermediate school district has 600 employees, um, you know, servicing our our 16 local districts and and more. And you know we've we've been really intentional around our staff's uh, social emotional well being and mental health. Uh, we've got uh, a very extensive uh, committee. We're fortunate to have uh, mental health providers that uh, have an expertise, uh, but we've, um, you know, we've got programs where uh, we're, uh, we're challenging uh, folks in a, in a very friendly, competitive way, whether it's uh, physical well-being or uh, mental well-being, and we have prizes that uh, folks can can achieve, and it, and just trying to make it fun and to let people know that uh, in order for you to truly be your full self and take care of kids, that you have to be in in the right spot um, uh, in order to be the most effective. Um, you know, I think of the image of the starving baker that they make for everyone else, but they don't take care of themselves. And so I think it's critically important that we all focus on our staff uh, in ensuring that they're in a, in a, in a very uh, healthy uh, mindset. Uh, let me ask, this is a little bit of an unfair question, but if you had to give um, our mental health system here in the state of Michigan a grade, uh, A through E, what would you, how would you rank us um, uh, in terms of the uh, reach of our system, the resources that we need, and uh, the impact that we're having uh, on uh, mental health of people living here and working here in our state? So why don't we start with uh, Kurt? Good question. I, I mean, I think the, the systems are challenged. I know that people in the trenches, the, you know, the people who are providing care, you know, they're all committed to the cause, but it's kind of how we all, how we all interconnect. How do people get to the right level of care? Um, so in terms of, I mean, that's what I see in each and every day, people are really committed to the work, but it's really those, those systemic issues across the spectrum, whether it be if you have private insurance, Medicaid, Medicare, lack of insurance, it's just 
you know, having, and this is not unique to Michigan, this is an issue statewide and nationally, of course, but, uh, you know, Michigan is uniquely positioned to do some things. So I think we're structured to deliver behavioral health care differently than other states. So I think there are some opportunities that John alluded to earlier. So grade, I don't know, that's a tough one. Uh, I'm going to say, a, I'm going to say a C plus on the systemic issues in terms of how we are doing care. And there's opportunity, no question. John? It's funny because I was actually vacillating between C plus and B minus because, you know, <laughs> and I, I really, I echo what, um, what Dr. Cummins said there because I think that we have a lot of champions and a lot of, you, you know, when you look at our med Medicaid in particular specialty supports and services array, it actually is quite evolved relative to, you know, other states in the nation. However, there's clearly access issues that we need to mitigate. And there are things that we need to do systemically and structurally, I think, to get us you know, to that next level. And that, that's not just the public behavioral health system, but also um, you know, the private uh, side of the equation too. Um, for example, one of the things that was asked earlier was about the, the mild to moderate you know, population versus more severe. And we do have an opportunity um, to kind of test out uh, what it might look like to kind of disregard that line, whatever that line means, right, uh, with our CCBHC demonstration, which really was the intent of that statute and, you know, Senator Stabenow's uh, vision for that. Um, so I'm excited to see, you know, where that goes, but there is clearly several opportunities for improvement. I, I know that the people, you know, on here as well as, you know, in my office are, you know, their hearts are absolutely there. They're passionate. It's just a matter of, you know, making the necessary progress. And I think right now we're at a very good time because we have, um, it may not seem like it, but we do have a lot of good relationships with our uh, legislative colleagues as well, um, partic particular to behavioral health. Um, and, and so I think that offers us a pretty unique opportunity because for years, I think behavioral health has generally been kind of, you know, by the wayside, if you will. Um, so I'm excited to see, you know, where things evolve and grow. I'm, I'm actually optimistic. Thanks. Uh, Shoba? I don't really know that I have much to add, but I will say though that um, even though our, our system is challenged that meeting the needs specifically of pediatrics quite significantly, um, the providers that I, you know, have worked with and been privileged to be able to work with that do service um, that age population, when you get in front of those providers, the care that you get really would be a solid A. So I, when you say, Dave, like, it's, it's an unfair question. It, it is quite a bit just because you can't, you can't provide like A quality care overall if you don't have the access. But when they do get the treatment, I do think though that it is good quality care. Thank you. What would you say, Nick? I, I, I would agree. Uh, the, the quality of care is, is superb. It's, it's access. Uh, I mean, when we see, uh, when we see a mental health crisis in, in specifically in, in our school that, that is for emotionally impaired uh, individuals and, and children, um, you know, there, there's a need um, from an access perspective, but the, the quality of care is, uh, I would definitely agree with uh, Dr. Ryan B and A. So that brings us uh, to the end of our program today. And I wanna thank uh, our speakers uh, for participating, very interesting presentations. Um, the presentation slides and the resources that our speakers mentioned are going to be posted. Well, you can see they're posted here. Um, our planning committee will be looking forward to the next year as we identify topics that we feel will benefit the Northern Michigan community. Um, so keep an eye on your email for more information and registration uh, for our fall 2021 event. Maybe that will even be um, in person. I want to thank NMC and Grand Valley State for organizing today's forum and to our sponsor, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan. So on behalf of Grand Valley, 
Grand Valley Traverse City Regional Center and Northwestern Michigan College. I want to thank again our presenters and thank all of you who participated as an audience for being with us today. Uh, please take care.